I'm going to start off by providing uh, an overview of self-care wellness during COVID, again, given our focus uh, on this echo. Um, I'm just going to go through our slides. I will say that uh, this is accredited by the U of T Continuing Medical Education. So if you are practicing a physician or senior trainee and you need um, to report any maintenance of certification credits, it is an accredited program. Um, these are my disclosures. Um, there's no uh, kind of additional support than our kind of operational support. And um, that this program um, is, uh, I will talk about evidence-based, I will actually share a couple of uh, studies very briefly today. Um, and anytime I'm speaking about my own personal experience, I'll be sure to, to disclose that. Um, so, you know, really to start off our echo coping with COVID, just wanted to cover a few things uh, to talk about distress um, in healthcare workers very briefly, although we'll have much more detailed sessions um, and uh, practical tools and, and skills later on. We'll identify the role of echo um, in terms of coping uh, in their current context, and then talk about some resources that are, are currently available and ones that will be emerging uh, even in the next few days to over the next week. Um, so, um, as part of kind of self-care and self-management, and many of you, if you've looked at various guidelines, know that having um, information, kind of sharing our um, best practices, the science, is an important part to alleviating um, some of the anxiety uh, on a day-to-day, -day, whether it's anxiety about um, caring for our patients in our current context, redeployment, or other. Um, and with that, I just wanted to, and I'm, I'm going to flip out of the, the sharing screen here, um, just wanted to take a chance, uh, take a, a moment, sorry, for us to have a chance to, to really uh, have you ask any questions that you might have about COVID, given uncertainty and the amount of information and, and rapid changes that are happening on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and so I was going to hand it over to Mona to open with a few comments as just some general information. Um, but while she's doing that, if you could take a moment to think about uh, what kinds of questions you want to ask um, or the things that have come up uh, in your settings that would be um, you'd like some clarification about from our hub. So I'll just hand it over to, to Mona to open up and then we'll take some questions. Okay, thanks, Sanjeev. And yes, please think of your questions. Um, just want to uh, you know, let everybody know that it's true we're, we're in a pandemic right now. Um, and, um, and it's important to stay calm and to also stay informed, which I'm sure many of you are doing. I think it's important to know that Canada has done a good job at, uh, at, uh, at, at dictating the physical isolation um, uh, about a week or 10 days ago. And because of that, what the modeling is showing is that the cases are likely to go up in the next week or two. So I think from an anxiety perspective, it's important that when you see the news reports of the cases going up over the next week, that that doesn't increase your anxiety, that that's actually what uh, is, ex is expected. And then they should go down after that. So I think that's an important point to know we understand quite a bit scientifically about uh, this uh, SARS, uh, uh, SARS uh, virus 2, um, and much more than we did in 2003 from SARS 1. So I think we're in a very good position in Canada. All right, thanks Mona. I'm, I'm just gonna see if, again, if people have questions, there are many ways you can, you can ask your question by raising your real hand, virtual hand, or if you, have some questions and you can put it in the chat as well and we can scan that as well. Oh, uh, there is already one question I see, Mona. How are people managing the concerns and safety of healthcare provider family members, especially if, you, uh, if the people you live with are in high risk categories? So any general approaches? Uh, well, I, I think, uh, first of all, it's important to know that the recommendations are evolving on a daily basis. Uh, so it's important to keep, keep up to date with what uh, Public Health Ontario or your regional public health are recommending. I think we all just got the notification that came out at 2 p.m. from the province that 
they're, uh, they're reinforcing the strict isolation from people who've traveled. And then, uh, I, and, and then they're also saying that physical, uh, physical distancing is essential for everybody. So that is important. The hospitals do have, most hospitals in Ontario have fairly good PPE. So you should be uh, using PPE. And I think you have to use common sense. Right now, there isn't necessarily strict distancing from your very close family members. But if you do have elderly, uh, elderly parents or, or grandparents or so forth, or family members that have uh, uh, co comorbid conditions, it is probably better if you are a frontline worker uh, to avoid to see them. Okay, and any other comments from our hub members too, if anyone else wants to make any additional comments as well? So I think um, what uh, Manafi touched on a bit earlier in the uh, week as well, was the reality is that you're actually, depending on the environment you're working in, if there's a lot of safety and PPE and the other protocols safely in place, you're at lower risk uh, than in settings where you actually may not have PPE that you need or the protocols on using and doffing and donning them uh, safely is not there. Um, and so to recognize your risk level may change depending on the context and the availability protections and the risk to your family members may change accordingly as well. Um, we have in primary care, I know there's uh, like multiple physicians um, in the family um, and the worry in their communities, maybe they actually can't afford to even risk the transmission because then the whole uh, community hospital would actually be compromised as to who's going to be taking care. So there's actually people beginning to have further boundaries within their house, depending on the risks, not just to vulnerable family members, but to their ability to keep on caring. Great, and then we have probably have time for uh, one more. And I, I should have mentioned at the beginning that I'm sure we're gonna have lots of questions and that's perfect. This is part, part of the venue for that. Uh, we are gonna keep tabs of all these questions for subsequent echoes so that we'll have rolling question lists that we'll continue to, to share and answer as we go because I think there's a lot of uh, um, information that people want. And so there is, um, um, one question about uh, how to keep vulnerable patient populations safe, um, uh, clients with mental health diagnoses who may not have insight about uh, self-isolation, health status, hygiene, um, and are there any practical tips or, or ways in which we can kind of work to support that? I don't know if anyone from our hub wants to tackle that one. I, I can, um, it's, hi, it's, hi, Lisa. it's Lisa Richardson here. Um, so we have some recommendations around uh, our patients who are inadequately housed. Um, and I think this could apply to, and, and we may be able to extrapolate something from it to apply to our, uh, our patients who don't have insight or an understanding. So for those patients, we have been told we will not discharge a person under investigation or a person who, is, who has uh, COVID um, out to the street or out just back to the shelter system. Um, we do uh, in all of the, re in, in, within the GTA, um, there are isolation shelters that have been set up for patients who are not adequately housed and they will, um, we have to contact the inner city health associates to make sure that those patients are discharged while they're under investigation or while they're positive to one of those isolation units. Um, this is being coordinated by the City of Toronto. So I wonder if it's an opportunity to look at a similar approach, possibly thinking about CAM at your group at CAMH, the impact teams, et cetera, to develop a similar model where if we have someone who's under investigation or is COVID positive, they could be connected. I'm putting it out there as an option. I know, I, I mean, that my response is related to our, our patients who don't have adequate housing, but um, maybe we can extend that in, in uh, to other communities. Thanks, Lisa, that's very helpful. And, and there are some uh, um, groups currently working on that, I think through the Toronto uh, area as well, and some recommendations. And, uh, and there are some resources that will likely pop up in the next week, I think, just some um, some practical yeah. guides. Yeah, go ahead, Javed. Um, I was going to mention is actually this is exactly the kind of case that we're probably going to start discussing starting next week is how do we actually have a composite patient like this who has these challenges and how will we begin to support you? And you'll get a risk of recommendations. I know we use different approaches for motivational interviewing and other strategies that you can use. What framing might help um, better adherence to safety protocols right now with your clients and patients? 
Great. Um, great. Any any other questions there that I can see if uh, um, so people are talking. There's another question about uh, approaches to easing our family members uh, when uh, we want to help vo by volunteering at screenings in our workplace. What are some approaches to helping some of the anxiety that our family might be experiencing? Mona, do you want to take that one there? Sure, I think Javid um, answered that really well. It really comes down to uh, PPE. Um, I, for, I, I worked during SARS and um, uh, frontline and was staying with my parents and we didn't even understand the transmission of that virus at the time. And so there was a lot of fears related to that. With this virus, we understand the transmission pretty well. We're almost there, I would say. So if you're, if you're going to be volunteering and the hospital that you're working at does have uh, enough PPE and good PPE, then I, I think that that reassures your family members. Um, and, then, uh, and then you have to use uh, some common sense in terms of if the hospital you're volunteering at doesn't have PPE and doesn't have good PPE, either you can choose to not volunteer or um, or you can choose uh, to isolate yourself from your family members. Any other comments, Lisa? Yeah, go ahead, Lisa. Yeah, I just, I just, I think um, because I, I've also done some work around thinking about this risk for our own Department of Medicine members and talked to, to quite a few infection prevention folks. And one of the things to also consider is if you're that healthcare provider, what activities, doing a risk assessment, not only for who you're living with, so do you have someone immunosuppressed or elderly or with other chronic medical conditions who would be more at risk? But also, what are you doing on a day-to-day -day basis? If you're a respiratory therapist working in the intensive care unit and you're intubating four to five people a day or exposed to aerosol-generating medical procedures, then obviously you, and, you, know, you may make a different assessment than you would make if you are um, uh, you know, just asking people questions in a in full gear and not exposed or not touching them and ma maintaining social distance so i think also considering that piece as you're doing the volunteer you know as you're thinking about what activities you're going to engage with and explaining that to your family members too great some great very helpful advice i think uh allison do i have time for one more question you think one more um sure or, or you could weave it in you could do some of your slides okay well, we'll come back. There is a couple more questions. I'm the <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, thanks, Allison. Thanks. So I'll go back, and we'll, if there's questions at the end too, we can we can uh, definitely uh, come back to some of these questions. Um, just gonna make sure. All right. Can you see the slides now? Are you able to see them? Perfect. Um, so I I just want to say, uh, you know, as we're in the midst of of COVID right now that you would have probably all seen an article that was being sent around in your networks about uh, psychological dist distress in the, uh, in the more acute phase uh, of the pandemic. Um, and this is kind of data from that. And I, I compare it with another piece of data that was again, more in the acute phase um, uh, from SARS. Uh, and just will say that, uh, you know, we usually don't think about, based on the literature, and there's some great work from a, our Toronto group at Mount Sinai that uh, looked at psychiatric illness, that there isn't really high rates of formal psychiatric illness, but a lot of uh, more what's been re reported is more uh, related to distress, like psychological distress more broadly in the context of all the kind of concerns uh, and care that we're providing. And here was 70% of providers, uh, and this was uh, a majority in nurses, but a good proportion uh, that were physicians, about a third that were physicians. Uh, both of these studies had about uh, just under 1,300 uh, uh, healthcare providers responding. And you see the depressive symptoms, anxiety, insomnia. These are symptoms, these are not diagnoses. Um, and uh, again, quite high rates. Uh, given the, the care, some of the issues that we've been talking about, and uh, uh, ongoing factors. You, you might be asking why was SARS higher in this particular one? It's just a matter of the scale. The scale used in the in the SARS study is much more sensitive. It's uh, whereas the depression, anxiety uh, scales that were used in this more recent study out in JAMA Open uh, used formal 
more formal clinical tools like the PHK-9 and GAD-7. So just to let you know that, again, this is part of the reason why we're, we've created these uh, this ECHO is to uh, address some of these uh, concerns and pre prevent it. And as Mona highlighted, we're, we're trying to be proactive here and, and use what we've learned from before uh, to start to address these, um, these symptoms and challenges more, more earlier on. And now we'll talk about the issue that we're we're all we're all facing, and uh, you know, disclose that you know I'm currently on self isolation, um, and um, uh, post travel, and so uh, as a result of this, you know, quarantine self isolation brings its own distress, and again, during the issues about duration, fears of infection, frustration, boredom, um, I I would say it's kind of supplies. Um, not being a bit disconnected and isolated, so not having good information to kind of make decisions and, and comprehend um, the situation. Uh, finances, again, for uh, different people uh, who aren't able to work or sustain an income, this is a huge concern. And I will say, you know, doing phone visits from home is the number one thing I hear from my patients who are uh, in self-isolation and or their uh, businesses have been shut down. Um, and so, uh, again, a huge stress. Uh, po the post-quarantine, again, uh, uh, unstable kind of finances, but I would say uh, stigma related to, um, you know, going back to a work setting after quarantine and people wondering about your status, whether you're kind of, uh, we're on quarantine or self-isolation for being COVID positive or for um, uh, other reasons, and then managing uh, the quarantine, what you can do is really getting accurate information, which we hope we can do through the ECHO here, um, getting help with uh, enough supplies, communication and, and staying connected. And again, um, you know, we've been hearing about uh, self-isolation or self uh, and distancing um, and how it's our, our responsibility and, and really doing this for others around us. And so the, uh, when that's the kind of uh, framing of this, it uh, definitely has an impact in reducing the amount of distress that someone might experience during this time. I'll say what, why we are using ECHO here, and again, Allison alluded to it, that it is a hub and spoke model. It has been created since 2003 in New Mexico and now it's global. There are like 300 um, ECHOs or more uh, globally and we are part of ECHO Ontario. And again, it's about trying to take the knowledge that we might have um, in certain areas and expand that more broadly when people don't have access to good knowledge, skills, and strategies. And so, although it's been used for patient care specifically, this is for providers who are delivering the care. So we will focus on tips on what might be helpful for ourselves in terms of self-care, but also self-care for our patients. I think there's a, a natural tendency for that. Uh, and again, it is hub and spoke. And although we have our hub team, this is really about learning loops. We're learning from each other um, and the knowledge that we share. We hope that we can share resources that all of you are picking up uh, throughout your context and your uh, your work um, and, and really thinking about sharing that uh, with one another. And we'll, we do have a community of practice website that will actually share and house all this information, which we'll talk about shortly. Um, so here, this, this uh, Coping with COVID Echo is about information sharing updates, bringing out attention awareness. We are going to talk about some self-management skills. We won't get into it today, but this is part of our framing for our Echo in our first session. Really, the essence, though, is to build a community of practice. We've been doing this in other contexts um, before COVID and really found it a great way to connect people who might be more... Um, remote areas may not have as much access to information or people to bounce off ideas or to clarify uh, and really to spread information and practices to our peers and uh, ultimately uh, many of these which will be applicable to our patients. Um, and so our session is something brief like this, a didactic, but we will have case discussions with uh, which Allison talked about which will uh, allow us to really practice uh, some of the things we're talking about. Uh, I just will say as part of early resources, some of the resources that we've um, uh, been using as the backdrop for this echo uh, for mental health, the CAMH website does have a mental health and COVID-19 pandemic uh, resource list, which continues to be updated on a daily basis. You can see some of the headings there. Um, it does cover things like, um, you know, uh, addressing anxiety and fear, 
uh, uh, credible uh, COVID-19 uh, information, uh, assessing personal risk, but things like um, strategies to deal with uh, uh, challenging worries and anxiety, so how do we cope with that, uh, relaxation, meditation, um, some self-care, including nutrition, sleep, and physical activity, but also uh, practical problem-solving techniques as well. Uh, I will say that uh, we are building this out for, uh, further, and so what we start to collect through ECHO and start to prepare for you, we will be sharing, again, on that page, there will be a new tab that will be emerging for healthcare providers very shortly that will have those resources, and they'll be twofold for healthcare providers for our own self-care and uh, resilience, um, but also for um, uh, healthcare providers to use uh, when they're uh, managing patients um, in the context of COVID um, and specifically related to mental health. So those mental health related resources, uh, clinical resources will be there uh, shortly. We are compiling that list and so it should be up by next week, uh, I'm hoping. Uh, with that, we also will be having a centralized kind of intake for people who are healthcare providers who might be struggling um, with managing distress, uh, or uh, with uh, mental health uh, issues that might be arising, we will have a single point of entry uh, for people to access services, whether it be counseling, kind of psychological service, uh, services, assessment and treatment. So that'll be available, um, again, uh, I, I'm expecting next week uh, for all healthcare providers. So again, we'll, we'll post that information through this echo uh, for you and you'll have access to it. But I'm going to stop there. It's just more an overview and orientation to ECHO, why we uh, kind of created this uh, for our groups. Um, the goal is to really create, create this community of practice during this time. I think bringing us together is uh, critical. Um, and again, we are going to try our best to connect to all the resources, the evidence space supports uh, with the goal of addressing kind of mental health needs of ourselves but all, and our patients as well. Um, so I'll stop there. Just a brief overview for today.